had a very strong mindset. It didn't matter how I felt. I never missed a workout. I never missed a meal. I've said this before. I never missed taking my nutritional supplements on a schedule. I just was a machine like that. I knew that I had to be a machine if I wanted to get the best possible results. And that's the same thing. Even it's true. It'll be true for eternity. The guys that put in the most work and consistently day after day after day do the right thing, get the best results. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RxSaltVisionRxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Whatever is rattling around in your mind, it is all on the table. Whatever you want to ask Dave, bodybuilding and non-bodybuilding related. We go right into the questions. The first two questions on the show, of course, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. First question, where should a female bodybuilder's testosterone and free testosterone be? Does it need to be in a different range dependent on wellness or bodybuilding or what is the minimum needed for a female competitor? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of like a loaded question because there's you know there's a range you know of of women's testosterone values that that are acceptable, and you know lately I've seen a lot of these um, clinics putting women on testosterone, and it's raising their level. And I mean they're putting them on small amounts like five milligrams a week, and it but it's still raising their levels, you know, a little higher than I I would be comfortable with. I mean, yeah, I know. Of course, the women feel good on it. Who doesn't? Everyone feels good on testosterone, but you know, you can get some side effects, and they can be cumulative. It might not happen right away, but it can happen over a couple of years. So, um, I don't necessarily know if, like, uh, you know, a super low testosterone is necessarily a bad thing, especially if a woman's taking Anabar or growth hormone. You know, a lot of times Anabar suppresses natural testosterone in women. You know, so because women don't crank out testosterone, they produce DHEA dihydroepiandrosterone from their adrenal glands, which then can convert into testosterone as the body needs it. But if the woman is on like Anavar or Winchurl or something like that, the body might not need it. It might not convert as much. So testosterone levels in the bloodstream are not necessarily the do all and end all unless the woman's completely natural. Some women, they hit menopause, their testosterone drops, but it really shouldn't because think about it. What is menopause? Menopause is that the ovaries are not producing estrogen anymore. Uh, the female reproductive you know, organs are not working anymore, but it doesn't mean that the adrenal glands are not working anymore, which is where DHEA and then uh, thus testosterone is produced. So I don't really buy it so much, but you know, like I said, if I was a woman and, and my testosterone was a little low, rather than taking testosterone, I would probably take DHEA, which number one is available without a prescription. It's super cheap. You can get it from amazon.com. Life Extension has a nice brand of it. And then your body will convert what it wants, you know, take like 50 milligrams, you know, a day, 25, 50 milligrams a day, and your body will convert what it needs into testosterone. And this way you don't have to worry about, am I taking too much? Am I taking too little? Uh, is my level good or not? The, the woman's body will regulate where it wants to go with it. And that's just my suggestion. Second question from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Another question uh, relating to the female bodybuilding side of things, uh, sticking with wellness. Um, I'm working with a wellness competitor wanting to pack 15 pounds on, wanting to save Anavar for prep for prep for next year's shows. What injectable can we give her in small amounts to assist in recovery? Mass building is NPP safe in small amounts. I've heard pre-mail, but you can't trust the black market as it often is test problem. We don't want that in her. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you could use um uh Prima Bone. But just test it with the Roy test kits that I sell at uh, DavePalumbo.com. 
comes back good, then then don't worry about it. You can give her 50 milligrams a week of Pramavol. Uh, you know, you could use Winstrel if you had to. I know you want to say, say, quote, save it, but you know, women, because you're not really taking a lot of these drugs, respond pretty well, even though you use pretty much the same drugs over and over. So even though you're going to use Anivar and Winstrel uh, pre-contest, maybe, you, you know, you can still use them off-season and get results from it. There's, there's no, there's nothing detrimental. I think a lot of women step over the boundary line and they just don't even know that they're doing that because no one tells them this because their coaches or their boyfriends just say, hey, if I'm taking NPP or I'm taking this, I'll just give my girlfriend a little less than what I'm taking <laughs> or a lot, even a lot less is not good. These drugs are androgenizing drugs, meaning they, they're going to masculinize the woman, whether it be DECA, whether it be short-acting DECA, NPP, whether it be Tyranibol, or, which is really just weak Dianabol. They're all, they all cause side effects in women, like bad side effects, you know, hair growth, uh, deepening of the voice, uh, you know, thickening of the jaw. And once again, it doesn't happen in a week or two or three or four. It happens over the course of, you know, months of using it. No one just uses this stuff once, okay? They're going to use it. It worked great. We're going to use it again. And then it's a cumulative type thing. So I, I personally, I would keep women off of anything other than Anivar. If you don't want any side effects, if, you, if you're okay to deal with a couple of little side effects, then you can use some Winstrel and, and Prima Bone if you're you know, going to test those drugs to make sure that they're real, which is smart to do. And even test your Anivar because a lot of Anivar is just Dianabol. So you got you to test it with the Roy test kits that I sell. And for 20 bucks, I mean, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Just, just test the drugs so you know they're good. And you don't have to worry about it. But a lot of people use stuff. Once again, I had a bikini girl come to me and she was on testosterone and she was on Trenbolone. I'm like, what are you doing? First of all, you should, no woman should use these drugs and certainly not a bikini competitor. I mean, are you kidding me? They're actually, they're actually judging you on beauty in your division. I mean, you don't want to masculinize yourself. So, but a lot of women don't know because they're, they're misguided and they're given the wrong uh, information. You know, that's why. Um, I really make an effort to put a lot of women's information out there. And I, and I actually work with a lot of women and because I think they feel safe. They know I'm not going to let them use anything that's going to damage them long term. And uh, I could still get them in really good shape because there, there's plenty of stuff you can. Most women don't have a problem with muscle size. They have a problem with getting in shape. And you don't you need to use heavy androgens to get in shape. But they, matter of fact, steroids don't even burn fat. So people use those drugs thinking they're going to get them ripped and, and, and which in case it's all diet cardio and, and the fat burners like clenbuterol and T3 and stuff like that. So it is what it is. Just be very careful out there. If you're a woman, I, I, I can't uh, caution you enough. Uh, these questions of course came from the Dave Palumbo experience app. I've been getting a lot of good feedback. We've, we've had a lot new, a lot of new signups lately. You can download it from the Android store or the iTunes store, uh, depending on which phone you have. It's $29 a month. You get uh, access to all my writings, all my videos that I've done in one place. So it's easy to find. All my diets are on there. It's like a, a Dave Palumbo library of all my stuff. I answer questions for every from everyone there in an open forum. So everyone sees all the questions, all the answers. It's a learning experience. I do a Q&A video every single week specifically for the app. So it's like an extra Ask Dave you get every single week. And we put up a workout every week. So it's a really... It's a great resource if you're really serious about bodybuilding and you want to keep learning and expanding your education. It's a, it's a no-brainer. We go to our Instagram questions now. Again, if you're not already following us there, the handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're new to this channel, we welcome you. We ask that you subscribe below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our shows, segments, updates, new shows coming down the pipe. Of course, we have uh, all new episodes of Heavy Muscle Radio, After Hours from yesterday, live episode of After Hours, and a whole lot more on the channel right now. So if you haven't already done so, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support throughout the course of the calendar year. We had a couple of good questions from last week. We were a little short on time, but I wanted to address them now. Uh, this is a really good one because, you know, not only here in this country, but really around the world, um, Expenses are through the roof. Inflation is through the roof. So the question is from bodybuilding expressionists. Uh, any suggestion for working class guys wanting to compete? 
inflation through the roof, general expenses of living getting out of control. How does a blue collar working guy or woman pursue this sport with that predicament in mind? Did you yourself find yourself in this situation? I know you've answered this, you know, from the from the prism of college students, younger right. uh, bodybuilders looking to get into the sport. But yes, to answer those that have real world expenses still trying to bodybuild. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's, a hot, it's an expensive hobby. Uh, you know, a lot of people always, you know, most people make room in their budgets for their hobbies, you know, whether it be collecting baseball cards, you know, some people like to go on vacations. I don't think I ever took a vacation that wasn't bodybuilding related. I just didn't think it was worth spending the money on it. You know, most of my vacations I went on and I went to a lot of exotic places were always like guest posing jobs that I kind of just at, tacked on a few days to. So um, I, I try to also when I early in my career, I never went out to eat dinner ever. I never spent the money. I wouldn't I wouldn't waste it um, because dinner's expensive. You know, think about how many meals at home you can buy for the cost of one out going out dinner, you know. And so initially I'm talking about that. In the very fledgling part when I was still in college or still in medical school and I'm eating, you know, tuna and rice every meal. And, uh, you know, I was just I budgeted my money, you know, and, and that's all there was to it because bodybuilding was the most important thing to me. And I had to be able to have enough money to buy my supplements, my uh, my uh, drugs. And, you know, at some point, you know, I had to have a little bit of a slush fund in case I wanted to travel because I, I knew that it was imperative to go to the big shows like the Olympia and the Arnold. Now, luckily for me, I um, I started making decent money at, at a certain point, so I didn't have to struggle too many years like that, maybe two, three years. Um, but I was training people at the gym. I was bouncing on the weekends at, at I don't nightclubs. I don't even know if they do that anymore. <laughs> they have nightclubs anymore. But I would just you know bounce and I would make a couple you know hundred bucks a night you know for Friday Saturday night, and I just saved as much as I can you know, and and, and that was just the, the way I did things. Look, I I'm the kind of guy that you know if you know, you offered me a hundred bucks to, you know, wash your, your, you know, four cars in your driveway. I would do it back then. There was never like anything where I'd say, oh, I'm too good for that. I, I, that's just not in my character. I'm like a hustler. You know, I just shovel snow when I was a kid, deliver newspapers, whatever I can do for the money. So you find a way. Now, obviously there are people who are younger, who don't have the great jobs yet, but who have families. And I feel bad for those guys. Those are the guys that, you know, have a girlfriend or wife, and they have a young, you know, they, they maybe got the girlfriend, wife pregnant, you know, and they were only 20 years old and, and, and babies are very expensive, as Sid probably could attest to as well. So you have to, um, you know, in that situation, it becomes a like, what's more important in my life right now, my child or, or my selfish bodybuilding hobby. <laughs> you know? So unfortunately, you know, when you're when you're that's why I never I knew I didn't want kids while I competed. I wanted to live the selfish me, 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 me lifestyle so that I can give 100% to bodybuilding. Assuming you can do that, you find a way to make the money. You do extra stuff, you know, or whatever you have to do. Look, you know, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but most bodybuilders who use anabolic steroids usually buy extra and sell a couple to their buddies you know, and so they can pay for their own. It happens. That's why I always say never, ever, ever condemn anyone who's been arrested for selling or, or using steroids or having steroids because any bodybuilder out there who competes is, is just as guilty as that other person. And at any moment in time could find themselves on the other side of the law and being arrested because we are doing illegal things. It, it sucks that we have to do that. And I hope when uh, Bobby Kennedy's uh, uh, elected president, he'll make steroids legal because it's ridiculous that, that there are controlled substances that can result and guys going to jail for you know five six years it's just nuts um they're hormones they're not they're not, they're not recreational drugs that's another topic for another day uh with a reminder watch an only episode of after hours <laughs> yesterday oh yeah where they, yeah <laughs> second question again from our instagram feed. we got too much stimuli yesterday said that that was yeah. the problem <laughs> we had yeah. our stimuli sale and i'm drinking it right now because i'm so i've been so tired i don't know I, I did want to say uh, a big shout out to all of our speech nutrition <laughs> clients. Uh, I'm not going to say the exact number. But we had a big, big day yesterday. Yeah. We had our July 4th sale. Um, so very appreciative of all those that came through and made big orders. Um, you know, like on, you know, like days like yesterday and really uh, from the beginning, you know, that this 
business. This company wouldn't be anything without you guys. So uh, we appreciate, we're so appreciative of your business, your support and everything that you do to build this brand and make it what it is. And so happy to have you part of Team Species. Uh, so let's, you know, we often talk about older bodybuilders, right? And how once the legs go, they go. So this is a bodybuilder in their early 50s, A2 rhino, noticing quads are diminishing more and more, no matter how hard I train them. Um, especially my my vastus medialis, is there any way to slow down the process of sarcopenia? You know, you really shouldn't lose legs as you get older. I think a lot of guys stop training or have injuries. And the injuries I mean are usually like back problems, knee problems, hips, hip problems, which could ultimately lead to joint replacements down the road. And because of that, they can't train the way they need to. Um, if, you know, I had really good legs, obviously, when I was competing. And obviously, I have a torn quad on my right quad that was repaired three times, but it's still not partially attached there. I have a fused ankle on that leg. However, having said all that, <laughs> now that I'm training again, and I'm, I, I actually train that leg. I don't know how I do it, but it actually, since my ankle's been fused, it actually feels better because I have more stability in the leg. And my legs are growing. I don't know. They're responding. They're getting bigger. I think that um, a lot of people don't really know how to train their legs well. Uh, they built legs because they had just, you know, the willpower to do it. And now that they're a little older and they have some injuries or they maybe even, you know, don't have injuries, but they can't lift the heavy weights they did back, you know, by just muscling it up, they're having problems. So, and what I recommend to people is start over. A lot of times you have to wipe the slate clean. And almost reteach yourself how to leg press, how to how to squat properly, you know, wide stance, good form on the heels of your of your feet, you know, full range of motion, down below parallel, good stretch. And you're gonna have to, when you get older, stretch out before you do this. A lot of times it's a good idea to warm up on a bike for 10 minutes, get on the ground, do some stretches, stretch those hips and legs and pelvis out, then get into this into the into your leg exercises. Don't do a ridiculous amount of volume either, okay? Because what happens when you're doing volume is a lot of times you start working the joint. You know what I'm talking about. The muscle gets sore and you're kind of just letting, you know, pushing, you know, from other muscles, but the joint is really rubbing and grinding. And that's that's not going to lead to longevity with, with leg training. So um, I'm a, still a big believer of less volume, more intensity on my leg training. Um, I literally, I do two, three sets of leg press, usually the straight on leg press. And I'll do like two sets of uh, adductor and abductor. I do two, I usually two to three sets of leg extensions. I do about three sets to four sets of leg curls. And I'm, I'm trying to work myself back into doing squats, believe it or not. Just, I'm, right now I'm in body weight with the bar. Um, I know it sounds ridiculous with a fused ankle, but I can do it. I put my, you know, my, my heel doesn't really sit on the ground that well because I don't have, I can't bend it, but uh, I'm working through it because I know that just to get the range of motion down and, and really feeling those glutes contracting and everything like that, I'm going to engage those muscles that I had before. Key point is keep the flexibility. You got to stretch out every single day. I watch TV for an hour every night, like usually before I go to bed to kind of unwind and get my body, my mind off bodybuilding. And I'm a, I sit on the carpet in front of my um or the rug in front of my TV and I just stretch for a good 15 minutes while I'm watching TV. So it's it's not like it's like a it's not like it's a pain in the neck or anything like that. I, it feels good. And when I get into bed, I have a good night's sleep because I'm I'm all my pelvis and my lower back is all stretched out. But you got to do the stretching because if you lose flexibility, you're going to lose range of motion in your leg movements, and then that's going to also be a result of why you're not getting full leg development anymore. And I see a lot of guys my age in their fifties who, who just, who can't physically lower their body below parallel, even with zero weight on, on, on the bar, just their body weight, because they just don't have the flexibility. And that's, that's the reason they're not getting the leg development. So stretch, get deep tissue massages. A lot of these places will even stretch you if you ask them, you know, so they'll, they'll, they'll massage you and then they'll stretch you at the end for, for five to 10 minutes. It's worth it. Trust me. Oh, I, I love getting myself stretched by other people. It's so because it's you just lay there. It hurts, but it's a little, you, you don't have to do it yourself. It's a lot easier. Trust me. Uh, are you in the mood to hurt anyone's feelings? 
Sure, I'm always in the mood. <laughs> I, I I hate asking these questions, but I know yeah. the audience loves it when I ask these kind of questions. From yeah. Dedgwick, uh, whose pro debut from these guys are going to be the most impressive? So maybe maybe not a career forecast as far as who's going to be the best pro <laughs> of these three, but maybe who's going to be the most impressive out of the gate. Carlos uh, Thomas, Justin Shire, or Good Vito? All right. Um well, you, you know I have a uh, relationship with um, Carlos Thomas. You know, I helped him for the early part of his career. I think he is, he's the most dangerous guy of, of those guys you mentioned. I think he can go the furthest. I think, though, that he has um, – um, he's a perfectionist. He always wants to get on stage at his best. And if he doesn't think he's going to be his best, a lot of times he'll drop out of shows and um, or he won't do the show, which I can respect. But at some point, you know, he is a pro now. He's going to have to make that pro debut. Hopefully it'll be, you know, next couple of weeks. And he's just going to have to hit show. Sometimes, you know, things don't work out. Sometimes you have, uh, you know, mental things going on in your life. You know, a breakup with girlfriends. You know, things go wrong. You might get sick. You have to work through that. That's what champions do. Dorian was great at doing that. Dorian could tear a muscle six weeks before the Olympia and wind up on that stage and still win the show. And so... I think once Carlos gets a little tougher, he's got to start chewing on some nails, I think, every day. Once he does that, I think he's he's deadly on stage. I think Good Vito is going to be really good, too. He's young. He's up and coming. He's got pretty much all the body parts he needs. I, I don't know if he flows quite as well as Carlos, um, but he's going to definitely be good. And, 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 you know, I think all these guys that, they're, that are launching their pro debut are going to be good. But I think Carlos is the best. Isn't uh isn't Chris coaching a uh, good veto or am I mis or am I mistaken for another Brazilian pro? Um, good is, is I don't think good veto is Brazilian, is he? I think he did a Brazilian show, but isn't he uh, no. Russian? No, 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 no. My question oh. is, isn't Chris Cito coaching him, or or am I thinking yeah. of something? He is right. Okay, yeah, right. yeah he is. Uh. So we got this question. Actually, this gentleman's asked this question now for two, three weeks. I just never got around to it. He's asking it again, so I'll pay off his perseverance. Um, says, first of all, happy to see you back home. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Did Do you ever see yourself selling uh, RX Muscle and Species Nutrition and just concentrating on the red top business? Or do you always expect to be involved with the fitness industry in some way, shape, or form? I'm a good veto. Sorry, he is a Brazilian. I didn't know that. Okay. But um, yeah, you know, uh, it's a good question, actually, Sid, because I've thought about this before. I've, I've said to myself, I wonder what I'm going to be doing in like five, 10 years. You know, I, I as long as I keep enjoying what I'm doing, I usually don't stop. So it's usually when I hit a point where I feel like I can't go any further in something that I'll change gears a lot of times. Like when I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't compete and, and place higher. It wasn't that I quit bodybuilding. I just said, all right, well, I got to, I got to evolve and, and change and find something else where I can start, you know, working towards a, a higher goal. If you can't go beyond a certain point, you hit a ceiling that to me, if I'm not constantly, I'm like a shark, like it's the old Woody Allen joke. I'm like a shark. If I don't keep moving forward, I die, that type of thing. So I think that in the bodybuilding media industry, um, there's still a lot to do because it keeps evolving, and uh, I like reporting on the sport. I like analyzing it. I like all the personalities in it. I like to interview people. I'm enjoying myself still. I, I wish, you know what? I wish, I wish there was more recognition for what we. No, I'm not talking about recognition from the people in our sport because that people do very, very, uh, very complimentary to me. I, I run into people in the street all the time who recognize me. Security guards and in the hospital. I was in the emergency room on Friday night. Literally one of the uh, RNs there was a um, a guy from the gym. He's like, holy, uh, you know, I really respect you. Uh, he was talking my ear off. So in that respect, there's validation. But I, I'd like to take it to the next level. Like I would love to like be able to interview like real people like RFK Jr. and uh, you know celebrities and stuff like that. And you know, to kind of do more of that. So I, I don't see myself leaving bodybuilding, but I, I would definitely like to – uh, attract a bigger audience, you know, which obviously is going to help the species nutrition brand. Now, if someone came up to me and said, Hey, I'll give you so many million dollars for species. And I felt it was a good offer. 
an offer I couldn't refuse, as they would say in The Godfather. I would I would probably sell it, but knowing myself, I'd probably want to start another something company. But you know, right now I make a good living from that, so I, I don't see myself leaving that either because that's kind of like a little passion project too for me. You know, I, I always wanted to produce my own nutritional supplements so that I know that whatever I'm taking is the best out there. And so for me, um, this this is like my baby because I'm so pr- I could say I'm proud that here this is what I use. This is what I make, and and I make the best, and no one could deny it. You know, people might say you're stupid for making the best because it's ex- expensive to make the best, um, but it's what I'm. It's what I enjoy doing. So, for the foreseeable future, next five years, I don't see myself doing anything different than what I'm doing right now. Uh, reptiles is never going to be something that I think I could do full time. It's 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 a it's a hobby for me, um, and I treat it like a hobby. Sometimes I make money, sometimes I don't from it. Um, because I spend a lot of money. When you have a hobby, even if you make money from it, you, you usually take that money and reinvest it. And I don't need that money to live. So I usually kind of just break even at the end of the year. And um, so to me, yeah, that's just like a kind of like a little, uh, I'd hate to have to you know worry about, oh my God, if I don't produce so many snakes every year, I'm not going to make enough money to pay my bills. So that that's always going to be like a hobby. Although it, it is a pretty, if anyone's come to my facility and seen how many snakes I have, <laughs> it's a pretty... Pretty well-established hobby. Uh, And it is a business, obviously. So right now, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. But like I said, I'd like to continue to evolve. And that means that as new technology presents itself to us in our industry and enables us to, you know, I think the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as it it becomes easier and easier, easier to connect with different people. And so the the great thing about, you know, life is that you never know where you're going to be in five years. Uh, 10 years and who you're going to meet along the way. And so you never know. Like I said, I I think that um, I enjoy communicating with people and being an information provider and and that won't stop in that capacity. And once again, I'm kind of bit by, you know, like you guys are by the iron bug. I just don't don't think I'm going anywhere. I I can't get enough of it. You know, if if you can't get enough of something, you know, because it's in your blood, you're probably not going to stop doing it. Let's go to uh, B Winery question about before going on stage. Yeah. If your athletes did not fill out completely before going on stage, what would you have them take to get pumped up? I have a coach having me eat chocolate with Doritos, and that worked pretty good. Uh, I've done honey, non nitric oxide booster, Viagra an hour before going on stage. It just gave me a bad headache. So, again, question is, if they didn't fill out before going on stage, what would you have them take to get pumped up? There's nothing you can do at that point. If you get backstage and the person's flat as a pancake, there's it, there's nothing you're going to give them. Okay, there's I'm telling you, there's nothing you're going to give them that's going to fill them out in less than an hour. Okay, it's impossible. You're just going to make them probably look worse. You know, if you give them water, they're going to the water's going to go to all the wrong places initially. Okay, if you Give them, you know, too many sugary foods. What's going to happen invariably is their blood sugar is going to crash on stage and they're going to start sweating on stage profusely because they're they're going to have low blood sugar. Um, You know, the problem is not letting them get to that point, okay? And that's why usually the night before, if I feel like they're too hard or or they're looking too good, like they're peaking the night before, I'll give them like a burger and fries to try to unpeak them give them a little buffer of water so that when they go to sleep at night and they pee and they dry out, you know, they're not going to wake up in the morning too, too flat. Now, if you wake up in the morning at five in the morning and you have a 10, 11 in the you know, morning, you know, pre-judging, that's six hours. Now you can do something. You can give them small amounts of fluid. You can give them some junky food. And I don't, like I said, I don't like to do sugars because what is sugar going to do? Nothing. But you give them, so you give them like a little, uh, some, you know, McDonald's or usually I'll try to give them some, uh, you know, burger and fries always work well for me. I just, I just like it. The grease and, and it helps you go to the bathroom and, and, and all the salt in there really fills you out. I, I don't even have a problem doing like bake, uh, bacon, egg and cheese in the morning from like McDonald's. Um, that seems to work really well too. But once again, you have to make sure the person's not like lactose intolerant. You, you don't want to give them an upset stomach. The question is, you know, how much do you give them? And that's, you got to have to know how your athlete that you've been working with over the last 16 weeks responds to certain amounts of food. That's why it's a good idea to do mock, you know, carb ups 
in the weeks leading up to the show so you can see how an athlete responds. And if they do good to get too flat, what to do. But usually if they're too dehydrated, there's nothing you're going to be able to do really. Not, not in a short, short period of time. Uh, good one here from Arnold Teach. So it's a two-part question, but they kind of all uh, connect. One, how do you know it's time to get to come off a cycle and clean out? Two, how do you know it is time to get on a cycle and if you have fully cleaned out and recovered? You know, usually before you, um, you know, go on a cycle, you have like a set number of weeks you're going to do, right? 16 weeks, 18 weeks, 24 weeks, whatever it happens to be. Now, when you get to that close to that mark of when you were supposed to go off, you could either go off automatically or you can say, you know what? I still feel really good. I'm still growing. I'm responding. I'm going to do another four or six weeks. Or, you know, you might get to the, you know, 16 week, 18 week mark. And you might say, you know, I was going to do 24 weeks, but you know what? I feel like shit. Um, I'm not growing. I'm getting sick a lot. You know, I'm not gaining weight. I'm going to clean out now because I feel like I just, I'm a little toxic and then I'll do my clean out and then I'll go back on a cycle after. So once again, a lot of it's feedback wise, but you have to have some kind of a set plan ahead of time. You can't just, I have guys, unfortunately, who are like super neurotic that'll be like, you know, six or eight weeks into a cycle, like, you know, I just don't feel good. I'm not gaining. I'm like, well, you're, not, you're missing meals, you know? And they're like, well, I, I think I got to go off cycle. You, you can't go on and off cycles if you want to grow, okay? Certainly not if you're going to do like six week, eight weeks, and then you're going to be like, I got to go off a cycle because uh, I feel too toxic or I feel that. Because a lot of times it's just, you know, you feel crappy because you've gained 25 pounds and it's tiring to carry around that 25 pounds with you. So that's why a, a coach is important because a coach can differentiate. I can tell when a person is burnt out versus when they're just, you know, whining and complaining because maybe they're, they're, they're weighing too much or they're, and they're heavy and, and, and they don't want to continue or they're sick of eating. Everyone's got all these excuses. You can make all the excuses you want. But at the end of the day, you know, don't complain to me when when uh, you look at Nick Walker and see the results he made, and you want to you know you want to wonder why you only gained two pounds of muscle. Well, Nick Walker ain't crying about how much food he's got to eat and how hard he's got to train, and you know all the stuff he's got to take. He just does it, and that's why he gets the great results. And he does it consistently, and that's the key. My strength, the greatest strength as a bodybuilder wasn't necessarily my genetics because I really didn't have the greatest genetics. I had the good genetics for growing, the great, very good genetics for being lean. Structurally, I didn't have great genetics, but I had a very strong mindset. It didn't matter how I felt. I never missed a workout. I never missed a meal. I've said this before. I never missed taking my nutritional supplements on a schedule. I just was a machine like that. I knew that I had to be a machine if I wanted to get the best possible results. And that's the same thing. Even it's true. It'll be true for eternity. The guys that put in the most work and consistently day after day after day, do the right thing, get the best results. Take one more question. Uh, B winery. Good one here uh, regarding pre-contest cycles with your athletes. How long would you have them run a pre-contest cycle if they're doing multiple shows? For example, do a 16 week prep and then do a second show 10 weeks later. Would you keep them on everything or have them come off for a certain period of time before the second show, especially if they're using Winstrol, Trend, and Clint? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't clean them out, you know, the, between, between a show and another one 10 weeks later. You can't do that. That would be stupid. But you can certainly cut them back. I'd probably cut them back to 200 milligrams of testosterone only with a little, whatever, if they're using GH with the GH for maybe two weeks, three weeks. And then I would build them back up again for the last, you know, six or seven weeks and, and peak them again because there's no, you know, you're not going to lose anything, you know, dropping down your testosterone a little bit uh, for, the, for a few weeks and then kind of boom, put it all back in and, and blast them again. And they seem to have a nice little second, a uh, little second peak going on there. And then they seem to work well. It's I'll tell you one thing. I, I've, I've done it where I've done show multiple shows in a row. And the worst was when I had to go. I had to wait three weeks between shows. It felt like it was six months between these shows because I was so lean and it was I was so hungry and I was so ready to not be dieting anymore because you know I, I kind of mentally peaked for the first you know show uh, or, and then the show the week after that and then I had to wait another three weeks it was it was brutal I never I never did that again after that and it's it's just really tough 
Uh, so I know a lot of guys see these shows. Oh, there's a show here. And then there's another one in my backyard I'm going to do over here. And there's eight weeks apart. Eight weeks is a long time to go between – to continue dieting after your first show where you've actually peaked yourself out and come in at 0% body fat. So just remember that when you pick shows, try to put them close together. If you put them closer together, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, your thoughts on soluble corn fiber found in Quest bars and ready to drink protein drinks, uh, also inulin, are these good sources? Says he's already using Fiberlize. Yeah, the remember, all fiber is not created equal. The only one universal truth about fiber is that it's not absorbable. So, you have companies like high quality companies like Quest um, who use a soluble corn fiber okay it's not like psyllium it's just it's it's they're using it because it tastes like carbs okay because it tastes like it's corn based it holds the bar together uh, and you can't absorb it so it's you're basically putting in a a, a non-caloric carb source it doesn't have the benefits of like say a high potential uh, high potency psyllium it doesn't do all the wonderful things we talk about, like, you know, feed the gut bacteria and help you poop better and, you know, bulk your stool and lower your LDL cholesterol. It doesn't have all those, those good properties, but it's not absorbed. So, you know, when they put it in wraps or they put it in breads and they put it in, you know, you can make low carb in, you know, foods that are not absorbed, you know, the carb portion of it, that is. And that's great. Uh, but don't confuse and say, hell, you know what? I'm eating a Quest bar, I'm eating a, a keto wrap and uh, whatever else. And so I don't need to take a fiber supplement because I'm getting plenty of fiber. That fiber is not going to count towards the effect of fiber that you need in your diet, which would be nine grams at least once, I would say twice a day of a psyllium based fiber. You know, and once again, all psyllium based fibers are not created equal. The reason why my fiber lies works better than Metamucil is because we use a high swell rate psyllium. And you can tell the Metamucil is, is almost like finely, you know, it's like almost like a sand and it mixes, it mixes really, really easily. And that's because it doesn't swell as much. It doesn't grab as much water. You put mine and mix it. You mix fiberlize in water and you leave it for, go to the bathroom and come back. You can't, it's jello. You can't even eat it. You can't even drink it. You have to eat it with a spoon. Uh, because it's a high swell rate. And that's because it has more potency. It's going to have more bulking effect in your stool. You're going to have much better health benefits from that fiber. So all fibers universally are not absorbed, non-absorbable carb, very, very good. Um, but they all don't do the same thing health-wise. Uh, and that's why there's certain what I call food-grade fibers versus the health-grade fibers. And, uh, you know, you probably see guar gum, uh, and the xanthan gum and a lot of, those are those are fibers also inulin fiber is in stevia balance um it, it actually has a little bit of a taste to it it gives the the, the uh the stevia some some substance like so you can actually see it and because stevia the amount of stevia they use is very small and you can't absorb it so that's great but it's not it's not going to give you any benefits that's why i i the greatest fiber you know joke to me in the fi in the fiber industry is like this, those beta fibers they sell, they market them to old people or people who've never used a fiber supplement. And, and people love it because when you mix it, it completely disappears. I'm like, it's like you're drinking water. I'm like, they're like, this is great. This is the, I don't want to have to eat Dave's fiber. Dave's fiber is like, it's like, I got to, it's like swallowing cement, right? Because it's, even though it tastes good, it's thick. This bed of fiber is like drinking water. I, I get my fiber. The reason it's so easy, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. It's not going to make you go to the bathroom. It's not, it doesn't have any bulking effect to the stool. It's just fiber. So fiber is not fiber, but people don't understand that because they're not educated. So they think any fiber they take is going to do the job of what they want it to do, which is to lower the LL, build the LDL cholesterol, help them go to the bathroom, regulate them, you know, good colon health, feed the gut bacteria. Not going to do that, those products. Just not going to happen. Understand that difference between food grade versus, you know, health grade. We'll take one more question. We started this show talking about the expenses, uh, obviously, just in terms of real life expenses and trying to balance that uh, with bodybuilding and the expensive, quote unquote, hobby that it is. Question is from Fidel Abbas. Now, his question is more so 
kind of a general, what is the best way to make money in the industry, selling PEDs, coaching, competing, or starting a supplement company. I'll tilt it towards somebody who's starting to get into a business venture. Because starting a supplement company is just yeah. not going to be something you can do from the ground level and expect overnight success. But yeah. in general, someone who is looking to make some money, uh, maybe to keep themselves afloat, keep yeah. their bodybuilding aspirations afloat, um, yeah, and yeah, start to provide for themselves. What would be the initial route you would take to make money in the bodybuilding industry? Great, super great question, Sid. I, I think it's, I probably should do a separate video on this. You might even want to clip this video because I think yeah. this is good information. The easiest way to make money in bodybuilding is to sell drugs. Okay, that's the easiest. And you'll probably make the most, but you'll probably go to jail. Guaranteed. I remember my friend Bobby told me he was a, he was a, a, an FD, a DEA agent at one point. And he said, Dave, it's <laughs> because I know, you know, I know what we all have to do here to, 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 to be bodybuilders, but it's not, you know, if it's when, and, um, and that was back in the day before they had, you know, cell phones, uh, and, uh, they didn't really have emails. Everyone kind of just called each other on their home phone and, 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 you know, gave each other, Hey, meet me here, you know? Uh, so it was a lot harder to get in trouble nowadays. Guys are, you know, bringing in drugs from China. Um, there's emails. There's, there's, there's a paper trail a mile long. It's very easy to get caught. I, I would never sell drugs, you know, in this day and age ever. It's too easy to get caught. There's, and, and you can't even deny it because, because there's a, there's a paper trail a mile long. So that's a bad idea. Even though it's, 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 you can make the most money. It's a, it's a bad idea. So let's look at how a person legitimately can make a living as a bodybuilder. Well, there are a lot of options that were not available when I was starting my bodybuilding career because there was no social media. You have to nurture the social media as much as it's a distraction to a certain degree. And you don't have to do it while you're training. You don't, when you go to the gym to train, you don't have to take footage you know, constantly where it's going to distract you from your workout. You can go to the gym and, and do other footage there after you're done with your workout. The point is... Education is really good. People love to watch other people's journey. Reality TV is where it's always been last within the last 10 years, I would say. So start nurturing your, your, your social media. Yes, you might only have 100 followers, 200 followers, 300 followers initially, okay? But it takes time. So you have to start, you have to start somewhere. Like when I started my reptile channel, you know, I already had a very popular bodybuilding channel, but that didn't mean anything. And I had, a, I had it was humbling to start from you know zero again and and, and have to build that thing up. And now I have like twenty you know, over twenty thousand subscribers on that channel, and uh, you know I don't nurture it as much as I do the bodybuilding channel, and I'm not as well known in the reptile world. I am known, but I'm not as well known. So to me, that's that's a big accomplishment. But it took a while to do that. So you have to have be patient. Number one, number two, rather, and then you know to make money. Okay, you do anything that you possibly can. You talk to other companies, you do demos for them. You know, you have to, what, what you have to do is make yourself valuable. Why should I hire you? I have people contact me every single day. I want to work for you. I want to be an ambassador. I want to, I want to rep the product line. And a lot of times they're people that, that, that offer nothing in exchange for this. They're just because they're, they say, I'm going to promote it. I said, where you have, you have a hundred followers on social media. I said, you know, as a supplement company owner, if I'm going to give you free product or I'm going to give you exposure by saying you're my athlete, what are you going to give me in exchange? Every, and everyone starts off like gangbusters. You know, for a first week or two, they're posting every day and, and great. But can you continue to do it? And, you know, I wanted to work for metrics more than anything in the world when I was, you know, when I first started. I was I used to see uh, Paul DeMeo walking around with his metrics jacket on back in the day. He won the Nationals in 94, and I'm like, man, oh, I want one of those jackets. And it took, it took, I guess, three years. And, and then I started working for Dr. Scott Conley at Metrex. We bumped into each other in, in the Metrex Cafe. I, I bumped him actually into four different places. And that's because all I did was think about that, think about it, think about it. And, I can, and finally he said to me, you know, we keep bumping into each other. You want to come work for me? And I'm like, it was like almost like like – I couldn't believe he even asked me that. And it was great. And so, uh, but I, I over I did everything for them that I could possibly do. I did seminars. I may, I used to call them up and say, Hey, I have an idea for what I can do for you because I wanted them to see me as a valuable employee. Someone who they say to themselves, you know what? We got our money's worth out of this guy. And that's what social media is around. 
you want to work for a company, you got to show me your value. You got to work so hard so that I say, this guy is just, I mean, this girl is unbelievable. Look at all these posts she puts. She's got engagement. She answers people. She, you know, she helps sell product. Her coupon code that I made for her is, is super popular. People use it all the time. That's a valuable person that I want working for me. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to put that level of effort into it. But that's how you become a valuable person that, that companies want to hire. And the reason why there's not a lot of people out there is because there's not a lot of people that, that, that can put that level of dedication into it. Uh, a lot, people are very lazy. They think people are just going to sit back. They're going to sit back and people are going to just going to hand them money. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to work hard for it. And you're going to have to show your value. And you know what? I, I gave away free information for 10 years, okay, online before I ever charged a single person for, for coaching because there was really not, not a lot of coaching back in the 90s. I used to coach people for free. People always in and out of my house constantly. Every This is, once again, before the internet, so I couldn't really do it online. Everyone in the New York tri-state area would come to my house. I had people driving in from, from New Jersey just because they want, they knew that I would help people out, anyone. People would call me up randomly. Uh, So-and-so said I should contact you. Dave, you're the guy who's going to help me to tell me how to put muscle on or, or get in shape. And I'd be like, yeah, come over, you know, whatever. <laughs> and the, I never said no to people because I knew at some point in the future that I would want to maybe make my own, create my own supplement line, or I might want to do something. And I didn't even know what that something might be, but I wanted people to trust me and say, Hey, you know what? This guy help, selflessly helped us. Okay. He didn't, I wasn't paying him or anything. He did it out of the goodness of his heart because he wanted to really see me succeed. And, and, and you know, the word spreads by mouth. So you got to get a good reputation. So be an information provider and don't put out fault, bad information. Don't be lazy. Don't just read Wikipedia and, and start doing a video on, on what you read on Wikipedia. You have to have some real life, you know, experiences with what you're doing so that you can give people like stories like I'm giving you. Hey, Remember when I went to the, the, the supermarket and I, and I saw this, this, uh, this product and I looked at the label and I, it said, you know, carb free. But meanwhile, it had a million, it had, you know, 15 grams of sugar in it from natural sugars that are, you, you, you got to be an information product. People love to learn. And that's why these TikTok and Instagram videos reels are so, you know, are so popular now because it, it's like quick snippets of information you can get from, from people. And that seems to be how people are learning these days. You know, back in the day, you'd sit and watch an hour seminar. You know, I don't think of people have the attention span to do that anymore. But that's why Ask Dave is so popular because people can sit down for a half hour, you know, and, and, and learn every single week different information. And that's why I tell people that you're going to really like the Dave Palumbo Experience app because it does the same, more of the same thing. Um, however you learn, that's fine. You can digest your, your, your information any way you want. But once you start learning and applying it to yourself, then share it with the, with the rest of the people. I know this, this became a very convoluted answer, uh, but it's a, it's a very convoluted uh, you know, question. The question is, how do I make money in the industry? And the answer is, do everything you possibly can. Social media, make yourself available to supplement a company that you might find that you are aligned with, you know, what, what their belief system is and show them how value you, valuable you are. Go to shows like the Arnold, the Nationals, the, you know, the Olympia. Network with people at different booths, you know, and people who are there, supplement company owners. This is a small industry. Get people to know who you are and make yourself valuable. That's the key. Don't worry about the money at first. The money will come. But the first thing you should be worried about is establishing your reputation, educating yourself, and being a knowledgeable person because that's going to be a valuable employee down the road. Extremely, extremely well said. Um, you said something else. I was trying to see how I get there are so many so many bookmarks within what you just said where I was going to maybe ask a follow-up to it, but I think you encapsulated everything perfectly there. You know, and people contact Sid all the time, you know, because he works for obviously Species Nutrition too, and they're like, "I want to be an ambassador." Yeah. And, and 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 how many times do you get these people who who are begging you to be ambassadors, and then they don't want to do anything? 
you know, they, they put one post up and then they want to get free product for the rest of their life, you know, out of it, you know. So I can only add this from the perspective of, you know, somebody who's been, you know, manning, I guess, on the marketing side for species nutrition. And we've had all sorts of uh, a variety of experiences with with athletes. Right. And I'm talking about high level IFBB pros. I mean, obviously, you know, a legend like Lee Priest. But then we also obviously have had you know, ambassadors who, who are not going to have those kind of established followings. And that's sort of the discussion, because the question uh, was originally, you know, you're trying to make money, right? Uh, you know, if you're if you're established, obviously, money is going to come a little bit more easier to you. They're going to be companies that are going to be seeking you out as opposed to you seeking them out. But if you're trying to seek them out, right, you're trying to be a sponsored athlete or a brand ambassador, exactly like Dave said, you have to put it into terms of, what do you have to offer to the company, right? And sometimes it's not going to be your social media following. And if if you're going to come at someone, if you're going to come at a company and say, "Hey, uh, I want to be your brand ambassador," and that's it, right? I'm first thing I'm going to do, right? Simple enough. I'm going to look at your Instagram profile. I'm going to look at maybe your TikTok, whatever other social media profile, maybe your YouTube channel if you have one. If I see that you a do not have a following, and if that's all that you have given me to go by, uh, what? compel what is going to compel me to be like hey dave you, you got to go check this athlete out we need them whatever but if you come at me and say hey listen um i might not have the biggest social media following but you know this is what i'm gonna do this is the kind of content that i'm posting this is the kind of informational content that i'm posting this is the kind of you know you know day in the life of or me taking you through one of my training routines or by the way, yeah, fine. My social media following may not reflect it, but I do have a stable of clients that rely on me for my nutritional advice or what have you. You have to be able to provide, you know, some sort of worth to the company in order for the company to see you as an asset. And yes, fine. Even if not those things, there are going to be opportunities in person as well for demos, for, um, you know, expos. You know, come at us with something to the effect of, hey, listen, uh, the, the LA Fit Expo is taking place. I don't know exactly when, but, you know, I, I would love to represent you in some some capacity at the show. Is there an opportunity for us to work together? Maybe there is. You know, maybe you just have a good look, but your social media hasn't blown up. But we see some potential in you. We say to yourself, say to ourselves, all right, you know what? Maybe they're not that big social media story. Yet. And yes, we see social media because social media is what the world, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, revolves around. But you have to be able to provide value. It's like you apply for any job. Okay, what what value are you providing? You're you're applying to an accounting firm. Are you, you know, someone who's a smart accountant or a smart accounting student who is willing to be molded into a great accountant? You, you apply to a law firm. Are you a good lawyer? Are you a lawyer that's going to be, you know, someone that fresh out of law school is going to be able to be molded into a great lawyer? Same thing with this. If you're able to provide value and that value is going to come in different shapes, different forms, it's not one linear line. You know, at least then we have something to go by as far as right. how we can potentially work together. But I just wanted to say, Dave, you know, we're talking about Ask Dave. We're talking about some of the content that we do. I think maybe the highest form of compliment that, that I do receive in person or what have you is when somebody tells us they watch us during their cardio and you know something's funny because you know for those of you that don't know and i know i get the jokes all the time in the comment section oh the sid lift to sid lift yes i've kind of uh really undertaken um you know my um uh, you know lifting and training pretty seriously yeah over the course of the last three months yes yeah, so, i mean i you know I, I go to bevs now so i see a lot of people i love see you know that's where you will end up seeing a lot of the the RX muscle fan base and the fan base of yeah. other bodybuilding podcasts. So, um, you know, it's really cool to have those interactions, you know, beyond just, okay, obviously at the Olympia, at the Arnold or any show that I go to, but um, one of the coolest things that we do here that I do hear from them is that they watch our content uh, while doing their cardio. And, and, and I find myself doing the same thing, right? But that's kind of where I, you know, consume my bodybuilding content to keep abreast of what's going on in the industry, what have you. Obviously I'm looking at it from a different prism. A, a, a hardcore bodybuilder is watching Ask Dave because, you know, the knowledge you're providing them is going to allow them to better themselves as a competitive bodybuilder or as a coach to other competitive bodybuilders. So it is very cool when we do hear that. I mean, again, we, we talk about the term validation and so on and so forth. But uh, to hear that from a serious bodybuilder, you know, and again, like as far as how they consume us, when they're consuming us, and they're consuming us during a time frame in which they're in the gym, they're in their element, they kind of block off the rest of the world, but they're choosing, 
you know, to to consume as Steve or another, you know, piece of RX muscle content uh, during that part of the day where everything else is blocked off and they're just focused on their training. That's freaking cool. And again, we yeah. thank you for that. And thank you for all your ongoing support. But yeah, Dave, up to you if you want me to clip this or if you want me to keep this for the rest of the episode, because that was a very yeah, you can, uh, you can clip it too. But, you know, I, I think I wanted to mention one more way. I, I, I really I forgot to mention this. You know, one of the ways I was making a lot of money initially um, before I had my own nutrition company, and this was for years I did this, I always sold other people's products. And I'll tell you why. Because people at the gym, and, and you don't, you can be in Alabama, you can be in Tennessee, you can be in Arkansas, and you might be a, a you know, you know, a pretty good bodybuilder, and you might not be the best in the world, but you might be the big guy in the gym or one of the bigger guys in the gym, and people are going to be like, well, what do you use, you know? And if you like like a product like my Isolize, you know, Way Isolate, for instance, and it's a product that you believe in, you know, people will buy it from you. I used to sell, I had a friend, Steve Reeves, not the Steve Reeves, another Steve Reeves from, from um, Rhode Island. He made a protein. At the, he had a whey protein that, that he had an um, amazing flavor system in it. And it was, you know, no fat, you know, it was like, like one or two grams of carbs. It was, you know, like, it was like the, one of the original isolates that was out on the market. It wasn't a pure ice. I think it was a blend at the time. But this, we're talking, we're going way back, you know, we're going into like the, you know, late 90s or in the early 2000s. And he said, you know, I'm making this protein. I said, he sent me a couple tubs of it. I said, this stuff is great. I said, and um, so I said, you know, how much would you charge me if I bought, you know, a lot of this stuff? Because I know people are always asking me, hey, what do you use? So I started out buying like maybe two or three cases at a time from him. And I would put it in the trunk of my car. And when I would go to the gym and people would ask me, hey, what are you using? You know, or, or, or you know, I say, well, you want to say, I, I have this, this stuff, Reeves protein. It's great. And I would show them a tub of it. And they're like, give me, a key. I'll buy a tub of it from you. And little by little, I started selling it. And, and literally it got to the point where I was ordering a pallet at a time from him. And my whole garage, it came in this big five gallon spackle bucket. That's exactly what it looked like. And I had them stacked in my garage. People thought I was like, like doing spackling jobs <laughs> for people. It was lined up. My garage was lined with this stuff in, in, in back in New York. And I would load my trunk up with, with, you know, I think it was three flavors. I would put like, you know, three or four of each flavor in my trunk. And I would just go every day I'd go to the gym and people would be like, hey, you got that protein? You got that protein? And I was selling a ton of this stuff. And I was making more money per tub than he was because, you know, whey protein is, is expensive. I was probably making about, you know, 10 or 12 bucks. I don't know I was making more than that. I was making about 14, 15 bucks a tub. And I was selling like like a, like probably like fifty to sixty a week of these things, and so I was making money, and he was happy. I was buying from him, you know. And if you believe in a product line, you got to invest some money to make. No one wants to put out a, a penny. They want to like a coupon code. If I was around today and, and I didn't have my own supplement line, I would find the line that I most liked to use myself. I would contact the company and say, I want to hold, I want to open a wholesale account and I would buy pallets of the stuff or I'd buy cases of it. I'd stock it in my house and I would sell it to all my, all the people in the gym and all my clients. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. It's an easy way to make money. You don't have to, you don't have to put, there's no minimums. You can buy what you want, you know, and it's, there's, there's no chance of losing money on the stuff. It's, it's unbelievable that more people don't do that. And by the way, I do have a lot of people who follow me and clients who do buy species wholesale and they sell it in their gyms or they sell it to their personal training clients and, and they do make money from it and they feel, they feel good about recommending it because it's a product they use and they know there's the science there. And a lot, there's a lot, you know, a lot of like, there's a lot of people with a lot of money out there, uh, doctors, lawyers, you know, professional people, nurses, you know, people in their own business. And they go to these personal training gyms or they go to the gym and they don't know anything about nutrition. They don't know anything about supplements. They want to ask the bodybuilders, what should I use? And rather than sending them to someone else, this is a way for you to make money and residual money. Because once they buy from you once, if they like the product, you're going to keep buying it from you. So don't be silly. You know, don't be lazy. It's okay to spend a thousand dollars and buying, you know, other people's products and stocking it and then turning that thousand dollars into five thousand dollars, you know. Uh, I did it for many, many, many years before I had my own line. And you know what? 
it was, it, I, I had all this, it paid for my groceries and my spending money every week. And it was one less expense I had. And it was, in, and I didn't have to do anything. It just, it, once I told people about it, then they started telling other people before I know it, this guy, Steve, at some point stopped, he start, stopped his nutrition line. He now makes a very popular peanut butter line, but he stopped the, 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 the nutrition line because whey protein got too expensive. And um, people were mad. They were mad. They were like yelling at me. I, hey, I need my Reeves protein. So that's when I started ice. That's when I started species. At that point, I had had the two fat burners, lipolyzed and so much. That's when I started isolized. I said, all right, I got to say, I'm going to make a protein. I didn't want to do this because it's going to have to order minimums. But that's how I got into making protein because everyone was driving me crazy. I didn't have this other protein brand. And I said, fine. I went to my uh, manufacturer. I found someone and, and, and they were able to make what I want. I made it better than Reeves. I, I went to a pure isolate uh, with zero lactose, you know, and I, and, I, and I got some crazy great flavors. And that's how I got into the business. But that's how it started. You cannot be afraid to invest in yourself. And that's the key. You're investing in yourself. You're not giving someone else money and saying, here, invest this for me, or which you're more than likely going to lose. You're investing in yourself. And you know what you're capable of selling and what you're capable of doing. You just believe in yourself. I remember when I wrote that first check <laughs> for, for the, um, the first load of lipolyzed fat burner. I had to spend, I think it was like $8,000 for like the first run. I don't know, it was like 1,500 bottles. I don't even remember what it was for, how many bottles it was. And the girl I was dating at the time, she's like, are you out of your mind? $8,000? I'm like, I got I to gotta buy the inventory if I'm going to sell it. you know. And that's that's how Species started. And I turned that 8,000 into probably 25,000. So, and then I took that and reinvested it and you know, I bought it, started another skew product. That's how it starts. You don't go from like day one to selling your own product line. You sell other people's products lines that you believe in. And it builds and builds and builds. Don't be afraid to invest in yourself. That's my best advice to you today. That is going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, if you haven't done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. We'll have all new episodes of After Hours from yesterday, Heavy Muscle Radio, and then, of course, tomorrow, all new episode of Iron Rage with Lee Priest. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.